Good morning, everyone. Just came in off of a commercial break, so we're glad to be back live with you here. No, this is just getting me down. Uh, so, we'll be honest with you, because I always am. I know I can say that. Like, I lied to you 90% of the time. But today, I'm going to be absolutely honest with you. Last time, we were out partying late with Byron on his birthday, right? We were, we were having some steak over there at Texas Cattle Company. And we got home, and I've been praying, what, what am I going to preach on? And everything was a little discombobulated, trying to get everything organized and planned out. And George comes to me. This is the scripture you need to preach on. I said, okay, which one? He goes, and he was going through a couple books of Timothy, all of us too. And he picked out this verse, because it means something to you, does it not? I believe it was one of George's karate verses. And when you hear this verse, it's one of those nugget verses that we all have heard and we cling to. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we hear your word, may we not only cling to it in, a, in words, but in our actions. Lord God, thank you for this message this morning. Thank you for the people that are tuning in. Thank you for those that are here to hear this message. Lord, I am thankful that all I got to do is share your word, not mine. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Life by the Spirit. It's going to sound very cliche. So here it goes. 2 Timothy 1.7. We've all heard it somewhere. You have it written down. You have it on little posters around. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power of love, and of self-discipline. Sounds great that all I've got to do is know God and by the power of the Holy Spirit that I am not going to have a spirit of timidity. How many of you right now are still timid about things? Everybody. I'm, I'm about as loud as you can be. I have a secretary at work, and on the phone she had, there's two people that she calls the loudest two men that she knows. One is me and one's another buddy of mine. Rhett, if you're looking there, I ever see this, is my buddy Rhett Rollison. And she had him on the phone and me in the office, and he and I were having a conversation with her in the middle. She's like, y'all are the loudest two human beings I know. And I think about that, and there are a lot of times I am, and that's okay with me. I'm, I'm good with my own shell. I'm fine being that person. But in my existence, there are things that I'm timid about. My wife can tell you there will be times where I'm just kind of like, I'm not, I don't, I don't. And, and we all have moments of that. So don't take this scripture to be that as soon as you ask Jesus into your heart or into your life, and you all of a sudden you have the Holy Spirit, now you're this, you're Superman, or you're going to, listen, it's okay, because I'm going to tell you today what the rest of the scripture says. Unfortunately, as Christians, we grew up in Sunday school, if we went to church, and we hear these things, and we hear the powerful gets the punchline or the end of it, but we forget all the other things that go along with this. So, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity. We are God's people. Watch some DC movie this week, and I, and I like whenever they, they fought in the Justice League, and they say, I ne and the bad, bad guy who's really bad, and I, I can tell you all about it later if we want to talk DC, I'm really Marvel, but DC was pretty good. Is This is what he said, and it was a quote in the movie that I said, we should preach that and teach that. I never thought that the earthlings could work together and fight like they did. He always saw earth as people and as creatures and as beings who could never unite for anything. Look around you. We're kind of that way. We're separated by denomination. We're separated by location. We're separate. I'm from the south. I act different. I'm from the north. I act crazy. I'm from the... I mean, we have people and we, we say those things. It's called implicit bias. We just say, where are you from? As soon as you say where you're from, we're going to tell you how you act, how you talk, who you like, even who you voted for. That's the way we do it these days. Why? Because God never expected us to be separated. For God did not give us. I want you to understand that the first God, when he speaks to us, he does speak individually to you. But he's speaking to the corporate body. He never gave us the spirit of timidity. We're supposed to be bold and on fire for God. Everybody's in going, I don't know about him. All right. Not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of what? Power, love, and self-discipline. Yes, I like power. Mm, superhero. Power. I like love. Oh, we love everybody. Mm, self-discipline. Could you have just edited that part out? 
It should just say, give us power and love. Or power, power, wonder working power. Because you know you if I sang a song and him, let's all stand and sing. There's self-discipline, self-discipline, self-discipline. You all be like, that's the worst hymn ever. That's terrible. But he tells us that in the same scripture. So let's don't start the scripture or the teaching today picking apart the things that we want. I want you to hear what God said. Not a spirit of timidity, spirit of power, of love and self-discipline. Let's talk about that first. We're going to talk about love. They're not in order. Look what he says in verse 8 when it comes to love. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. As I started to put this sermon together and pray, God, where, where do you want me to go with it? It was very clear. Love. Lord, prisoner. I want to tell you that the greatest two scriptures are the two commandments that we are supposed to be living out boldly today. Everybody thinks it's, uh, we're supposed to be doing going out and doing this. Nah, nah. We're supposed to be making, uh-uh, uh-uh. He tells us the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord God with all your heart and your body and all your mind. Love Him with everything you got. And then what? Love your neighbor. This verse, right after he tells us about the power that you have, and he tells you to have a power of love, is to love the Lord. Don't be ashamed about it. Don't be ashamed to tell people why your life's different, why you walk different, why you talk different. At the game Friday night, um, one of the great things about my new job is that I have to be at every sporting event, don't I, babe? <laughs> it's like I said in the beginning of the year. And it was one of those ones I was praying about that. My father-in-law, my buddy, I told him I had to say these words, and they were, I was tiptoeing when I said them. Honey, if you want to see me for the next couple months, you got to do sports. I'm looking at Kimberly thinking, this isn't going to go over very well. She said, okay. So now they are part of my home team, home game um, group that gets things going for it. They run my hospitality tent. Kimberly's there, Rachel's there, my secretary's there, my brother was there in the tent Friday night. Had the Humphrey crew running the hospitality tent. They were just eating green cake and all the chili food, but they were, we were holding down the fort. And I said, if you want to see me, you have to be there. And she did, listen to me. One of the things about her being there is that she meets a lot of people who knew the old Randy. So Friday night, a blast from the past came up, and it's like, hey! And Kimberly can say this, because the lady said this, and I appreciate it. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a knock, and she knows who she is, and she's watching. She said, he's a good man. Even before he became a good man, he was a good man. And I thought for self, is that, is that a compliment? Or just that? that was, kind of. But listen, I don't want to be a good man. There are a lot of good people in this world. People say there's a lot of bad people. I'm telling you, there's a lot of good people as well. I want to be a God man. I want people to know by the way I walk and I talk who I love. Not where I go to church. Not whether I'm a religious man. I don't want to get into religion versus relationship. I just want people to know that I love God. Anytime, I'm not ashamed to tell them, Jesus is my Lord. Well, who runs your life? Jesus is my Lord. I'm going to have to pray about that. You used to think that was an excuse when people asked you tough questions. What are you going to do about that? Mm, let me pray about it. Meaning, I don't have an answer. I'm not really sure. Let me just take some time. No, I'm going to pray about it because that's what I'm supposed to do. He says, if you're going to have this power of love, you've got to love God, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and you've got to love me. Paul represents people. Sometimes we forget he was a disciple, yes, but he was no angel. That's a whole different being. He wasn't elevated. Guess what he was? He was a Christian. He was lost, and then he was found. He was blind, but then he could see. He was Paul. He was Saul, and then Paul. So if you're true about this love and this power, don't just love the Lord and forget everybody else. Love the one who went through it. Love those who might not be on this side. Listen, I'm telling you, if the church isn't loving the lost, no one else is. People say, well, they love each other. Not in the way God loves them. People will say they have a relationship. People will tell you, even a lost person who doesn't know Jesus will tell you, my life is good. It's not. 
It's not even yours, and it's not even living. By definition, everything they say in that is wrong. My life is good. No, your eternal death is good. Because that's what you're, you're agreeing to right now. Listen, Timothy is charging, and Paul is saying as he's telling Timothy, you've got to be about this. Not know people are about this. Not wear a shirt about it. Not write a, a, an email about it. But you've got to be about it. I've never, ever known somebody who was powerful and didn't do something. In all my superhero movies, Michael Wayne, they're not really superheroes until they do something heroic. They're just people with powers. Could you imagine? I have the power to pick the lottery numbers. I don't do anything with it. My life will change for not. Nothing. I have the power to heal somebody. And I don't use it. It's not really a power. It's uh, it's just something I think I might have I tried it. So why are we not given a power of love when we're not being heroes for love? The heroic ones who will love those who no one else will love. I heard a beautiful story about one of my football players. He's one of my favorite. I won't share his name, but I'll tell him on Monday that I preached about him. I had a parent come into my office and say, that young man is one of the best young men I've ever met. I said, why is that? He said, well, he was out on a date the other night, and the young lady called to say, I can't believe what just happened. He saw a homeless guy on the side of the corner. Now, he's a teenager. Most of us just forget they're out there. We turn away from them. We do something. We think what they're going to do with what we do with them. We're going to give them something, they're not going to, it's not going to help them. He saw a homeless guy who was barefooted, so guess what he did? Went and bought him shoes? No. He gave him his own shoes in the middle of the date. Spent the rest of the night barefooted. Because that young man knew what it meant to reach somebody in a heroic manner. That's the power of love. Well, that's Huey Lewis. Everybody just heard it. That's the... Miss wrote another song. See, I do whatever. The power of love. If we're not doing that... You just guess what you're saying? You're ashamed of God's love. We've been preaching this and teaching this to our son, George Kirkland Humphrey, for 29 years now. Your actions speak louder than your words. I really don't want to fight that kid when <laughs> he punches him. You just did. So from, don't, don't just sit there with a power of timidity or a spirit of timidity, a power of love. Then all of a sudden he talks about... Um, Suffering in the gospel, now he's the spirit, spirit of power. Here comes a spirit of power. Not just of love, but a power, of true power. Verse 8 says this, But join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Beautiful people, good to see you this morning. Good job, I'm going back. You'll be on live TV, but go on back. I want to ask you this morning, church, anybody online, how many of you have suffered this week for the power of God? Not many of us are going to raise our hands and say, I suffered for the power of God. Not many of us even understand what that means. Here's what I'm telling you it means. Suffering for the power of God means you don't get your way every single time. It's by God's power not yours. Spirit of timidity. But it says a power. Our power doesn't lie in ourselves. Superheroes. Superman. Let's just put it to rest right now. The greatest superhero is Superman. Not arguing. But guess what? He's not from this world. What? He's an alien in this world. Could be scriptural. And guess what? He doesn't get his power from this world. He gets it from the sun. You can preach a whole sermon on Superman, right? Listen, without the Son, he's powerless. So are you. If you're not relying on God's power to get you through the week, and you're trying to do it on your own, as Eddie said, we're going to need to be in church a little more often. People talk about Tuesday night and Wednesday nights, or regeneration, or getting more energy. It's re, you know, filling the battery packs back up, right? Well, if you're only waiting now, I'm telling you, if you're living on your own power, you need to be in it all the time. I would tell you, if you're going to rely on your own power, just stay in church. Don't ever leave. 
Actually, we're going to close the doors when this thing's over. So y'all have to go somewhere. And that's go home. But because of Jesus Christ, you get to go with him and through him. When God tells you you don't have a spirit of timidity, you have God power. You've got God love and you've got God power. And that's a God thing. Without him, you have none of those things. So all of a sudden you look at the scripture again where God did not give us a spirit of timidity. He gave us these things. And he's still giving them today. For many of us, we look back at the disciples and the apostles and we think, what amazing people they are. And they were. Believe me. They died for the gospel. They died for the gospel. They suffered physically. Paul, you can look at him and you go, my brother went through everything you could think of. But you're no different in the fact that God loves you and he gave you the same spirit, the same power, and the same opportunity. If you think the world was bad back then, it's bad today. You can look around. You don't have to go to a third world country. You don't have to fly across this globe to find someone to reach out to. You don't have to look and see, well, there's atrocities happening all over in this country and over here on this continent. They're happening right here in America. They're happening in your backyard. And don't ever think that Plain City is exempt from any of them. It's not. I used to think that as a little kid. We're just that homegrown. None of that ever comes here. It does. You have an opportunity. The last of the three. The one we want to take out is self-discipline. In the same passage, who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Why did you have to put an adjective there? Why do we have to call it a holy life? Why can't you just call us to life? Why can't you just say, you're going to be the power and we're going to live our lives the way we choose and it's going to be powerful. No, he says, I've called you to something. I've called you to live your life separate from the way the world does. For 2,000 years, the biggest problem with this thing we call church that is, is that the people and the power looked exactly the same in church as it did outside the church. People could could steal it and and make it up and lie about it. God's biggest problem is going to be false teachers in the last in the end times. Listen, we're going to have false people preaching and teaching all day long. We're going to have false theology. You're going to have false leaders. You're going to have false, 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 false. When God says, I've always wanted it to be about true and about me. And he said, he's called us to a holy life. Listen, if you're not living a holy life, you're not where God wants you to be. Just know that. I'm not going through and, and taking a chart or a list. Next week, there's going to be a little um, fill-out thing, and you're going to say, you do this, this, and this. No, it's not going to be like that. And you say, why? Because God knows. He's called us to a holy life, to a higher understanding, to a deeper understanding, to a stronger faith, to a stronger love, to a stronger power that's all in Him. Who has saved us and called us to a holy life. So for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but we're supposed to have a spirit of power in God, of love, of God, and of self-discipline by being called to a holy life. That's where the spirit of timidity just dies. It goes away. I've known people that are completely different in church than they are out of church. They leave those four walls of the church building and they're scared to death of what they're going to do. Everyone agrees it's hard to, to reach out to your own family. I remember being government pastor, and I was like, i got to make sure everybody in my family shared it with my brother over a phone call sitting in my office in Georgia. I remember on my dad's deathbed. He died how many years ago? 17 on Wednesday. And I can remember there as he's struggling to breathe, me being the annoying Christian son was going, are you sure you know? And he'd go, yes. Are you sure? And he finally was on a little breathing thing. He's like, I, I said it, yes. Now he's getting annoyed with me. Listen. You need to ask your family and friends and your loved ones, do they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? I'd like to see them for all eternity. I know for sure I'm going to see my brother and my mother and my dad for all eternity. I know that. People say, well, will you know them? I don't care. I know they're going to be there. So I can take great peace and strength on this side of heaven, knowing where they're going to be. And I'm telling you, when you're going through loss and trying to worry about what's going on in, in your life and how long you're going to live and what happens, listen, I'm going to tell you this. People are dying right and left. News all the time. Young person dies. Old people die. Middle-aged people die. All ages die. People die. 
The greatest comfort you get, the spirit of love and power and self-discipline tells me that when I know a believer dies, I know exactly where they are. Thank you, Lord, for giving us that. You gave us your son and you gave us an insight to heaven, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. And he's saying, if you will do that, I'm not timid about death. I don't fear death. Now, I fear some of the things that kind of lead you up to death, but I don't fear death. I don't get to pick the way I die. I know people do. I hope I do how many, yeah, how many of y'all said this? I hope I fall asleep and never wake again. This side of heaven. Everybody knows that, right? No one's ever that. I really hope my parachute doesn't open. Go, no, hey, we don't say that. <laughs> we want to pick this side. We want to pick how we go. And God says, no, you're just going. You're just going. You've got the prize. I've given it to you. The beautiful thing about George's selection on Scripture, because I don't think he has a spirit of timidity. I know he does not. I tried to teach him what that word timidity meant all his life. Don't go talk to those people. Don't go over there. I do believe he's learned what a, power, a spirit of power is. And I hope and pray that he always remembers that that's in God. And that his love is through God. And that he has to have a life of self-discipline. The beautiful thing is, Paul does preach and teach to Timothy and says, Young man, these are things you need to be talking about. You need to tell people. You need to understand this. But then he, he lets... Why does God let us off the hook? He's so wonderful, because it's called grace and mercy, that he comes through, he tells you, this is the thing we can't do that only God can do. Mike, I need you to do this. But I know you're not going to, so when you don't do this, here's what I need. We don't know that. We tell our children, and then we hope they don't do it. We tell our friends and family, don't do this, and we're hoping and praying they don't. God knows when he declares and asks what the answer is. Don't ever think that when we ask you to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he does not already know what your answer is. So he finishes out the scripture and passage like this. The end of verse 9. For God, oh, he swoops in again. For God, not because of anything we have done. Listen, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Let me tell you something I need you to understand today. It will, it will help you in understanding. God's grace was given to you before you messed up. God's grace was provided to you before you made the wrong turn and the wrong decision. God's grace was given to all humanity before it existed. Before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. It's not until you accept Jesus Christ that you really understand grace. Because you go, oh my goodness. I once was lost, and now I see. Or I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was wrong, and now I'm declared righteous. That's when grace truly just steps up to the plate. I receive it and believe it of our Savior Jesus Christ who has destroyed death. I don't think we ever realize or kind of, you know, I've seen the Passion play many times. Easter. I've seen it done in church. I've seen it done in France and Missouri. I've seen it done in other places. And every single time, I still get a little nervous. But then all of a sudden I know, whoo, that tomb was rolled, that stone was rolled away. And we believe he, he rose again. He, from death, he stole, he robbed the grave. Listen, he destroyed death for those who will believe and trust in him. We talk about a physical death. It's a transformation into an eternal life with him. My eternity began the moment I accepted him as Lord of my life. And he destroyed death. And he brought life into me and immortality and life. Through the thing that we call the gospel. It's the good news. It's the good news, Randy, that I've already done that. It's good news, Randy, that I've already provided that. It's good news that I thought way before you messed this thing up. It's good news that I had a plan before you deviated. It's good news before you made that choice. I had already set this in motion. And it's good news today that God already gave us 
power and love and the opportunity to live a holy life. And you can look around at each other. Some people are going, well, I don't know if they... Yes, he gave it to you. And I'm thankful that he gave it to me today. George, he gives it to you every single day. So live your life out in power, love, and self-discipline. Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord. That your ways are greater than ours. Woo! Lord, thank you so much that we don't have to look to our own attributes to obtain or be able to conquer fear. But instead, Lord, we can always turn to you, your power, your love, and your discipline. I think about that word discipline, Lord God, from the root of the word discipline.